Welcome back, my fellow assassins, to another episode of the Dark Assassins Podcast, the show that dives deep into not just technology, but the concepts, software, and procedures behind it all, and explains it so simply that even your grandma can understand it. As always, I'm your host, the Dark Assassin. So today's episode, we got another episode of Operation Core Dump, uh, where I'm going to break down a couple different things uh, that have I guess you could say come up or been kind of brought to my attention uh, this past week. Um, But before we get into that, we of course have to get into the what nerdy stuff have I been up to this week segment of the show. So first off, um, if any of you have tried to host something at your house, like a VPN, like I do, uh, you've almost certainly ran into the issue where your IP address has changed for your house, you didn't know it, you were out and about, tried to connect, and it didn't work. Um, Now maybe you are fancy schmancy and you run all of your services through some kind of like Cloudflare thing where it can like auto do the whole DNS thing so this isn't an issue for you. Maybe you're cool like that. Um, I don't do that, I just go go ham and go raw and just find out what my IP address is and connect with my VPN since I don't bother exposing anything because uh, I don't trust anything. And uh, as far as security goes, the the less you expose to the broader internet, the better. Um, so I was out and about this week and I tried to connect back to my house, to my VPN, and it wasn't working. And I was like, you know what? I bet my IP address changed. And obviously it did, because that's the whole point of this conversation right now. Um, but, and and the reason that why that happened, and probably the reason why it happens for you, um, is you'll have like a blip with your power goes out, or your router like gets cut, cut power or whatever, and then when you turn it back on, because you were disconnected from your ISP's network, When you reconnect, they're like, oh, they reconnected, and because you lost uh, connection, your IP address that you had gets shuffled back to their, uh, you know, list of IPs that they can lease out to people, so that when you reconnect, you're not necessarily guaranteed to get that same IP address, so then you get a new one, and then anything that you had referencing your global IP address for uh, for your house... Well, you're out of luck. Um, So I figured I need a way to make sure that I always know what my home IP address is. So if any of this shenanigans happens again, or my power goes out, or my ISP just randomly changes my um, IP on me, it doesn't matter, and I can make sure I have uh, whatever the current IP address is. So what I did for that was I I I can't say it's foolproof uh, because there's always the chance that either my VPN server is bunk and not working uh, the hypervisor it's running on is down for whatever reason uh, the power is just out or I just don't have internet at my house so nothing can connect even if I do have the right IP so it's not like foolproof but it takes out one of the biggest problems that I had when trying to connect which was the fact that my IP address changed so what I did was I wrote a script that would reach out and grab my global IP address and then compare that to what it has saved as my global IP address so basically all I did was pulled it once figured it out saved that to a file and then just always compare what the latest pool was to what you know I have saved on record. And then if that changes, then I update what I have saved on record and then push that change uh, to a server. Now, if I have a VPS or a virtual private server uh, in the cloud in Linode, so which I can access from anywhere, and it's easy to do... Um, because I can just, you know, SCP or secure shell copy with SSH, just, you know, copy it up to the server and I'm good to go. I can access it anywhere. 
um, and it's you know good to go that way. Uh, but I mean, you could easily do this, have a script like this running. I mean, I wrote it in Python, um, so you could literally run this on anything. Um, you could have it set up on like a Windows machine or on a Mac or something, and then have it you know auto connect to like your Dropbox, your OneDrive, your iCloud, Google Drive, you know whatever. You could have it auto sync um, to that folder or two that you could connect from anywhere, so you wouldn't have to worry about you know pushing it anywhere, having um, a VPS in the cloud somewhere if you already have some kind of cloud storage set up like that you could just have it automatically sync you know to whatever that cloud storage is and you'd be good to go and you could easily check what that ip is um so that was pretty much the solution that i came up with um now obviously there's going to be some problems like i mentioned if the internet goes out um you're obviously not going to be able to pull the global ip and then for whatever reason if you lose connection to the vps um, you wouldn't be able to push it if there was a change that occurred. Um, so it's obviously not, you know, 100% foolproof. Um, but I'm pretty confident that it's, you know, at least good enough where I could easily check, um, if I'm unable to connect to my VPN for whatever reason, I'd be easily able to check, be like, all right, did my IP address change? And then I could go check, you know, log into the, the server and be like, oh, you know, this file was updated five hours ago huh guess my ip changed um now i guess i should get into how i set this up because i mentioned you know it changed five hours ago um so the way i did this was i set up a cron job um so if you're unfamiliar with what a cron job is it's a it's a thing on unix based systems where it basically will run a sketch it's a, basically a scheduler so it'll schedule a task at you know given intervals so currently i have the script set to script set to run every hour so once every hour so 24 times a day it'll pull the ip check and then push if needed um, now you can pretty much get as fancy as you want um, with these cron jobs you can have them run every minute you could have them run once a month you could have them run every tuesday at 3 p.m you could have them run every other tuesday i mean you could Basically, whatever you can think as far as time intervals go, you can probably figure out a cron job for it. Um, so it's definitely a very cool and powerful tool um, if you want to have something run on a recurring basis and you don't just want to have a script that always runs like as soon as the system boots up and then just sleeps. Um, so it, it if you because if you do that then you're kind of, you know, you have an extra process running on your system, which potentially could be using up resources, using up CPU time that you don't need. Um, so that's kind of where a cron job could come in if you're, the majority of your time is just kind of waiting, doing nothing. And then, you know, in my case, every hour doing a check, um, it doesn't make sense to have a, a script, an infinite loop script that just kind of sits there and does nothing but, you know, hog resources and, you know, burn processor time. Um, so that's kind of why I went with the cron job route. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely very happy with how that script turned out. Um, and hopefully it'll kind of save my bacon, um, down the line if whenever my IP address changes again. Um, and then the other thing that I set up, uh, this week was a Docker container that allows me to, uh, basically get a virtual console of my, um, iDRAC 6 machine. Um, so I came across this uh, Docker container this week. Um, someone was like, hey, someone like posted uh, on a forum. They're like, hey, I found this cool Docker container which allows you to view iDRAC 6, you know, through VNC. And I was like, huh, that's pretty cool. Um, so if you're unfamiliar, uh, the iDRAC 6 is obviously Dell's, you know, IPMI implementation, which we've kind of been talking about the past couple weeks. Um, and one of the problems with iDRAC 6 was you needed Java in order to view, like, the KVM, so to actually be able to view what's on the screen of the system without actually having to, you know, plug in a monitor and keyboard. So you could just, you know, over the web or over the internet be able to, I guess internet's a better term, not not the web. Uh, over the internet, you'd be able to get, you know, a virtual console um, on your machine to be able to input commands, you know, view the BIOS, view what's on the 
the screen if you're running an operating system on it, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but the problem was you needed Java, and the problem with that was you needed an old version of Java that obviously isn't secure and uses an old version of TLS, which is, you know, it's it's a type of like encryption type stuff, uh, which is outdated, which is why it's not exactly secure. Um, so you don't exactly necessarily want that running on your machine. Um, so what this Docker container does is it basically sandboxes that whole thing. So basically puts the old version of Java with a, I believe it's a, some kind of Linux flavor distro i don't remember exactly which one it is but it basically puts those together in a containerized contained environment so you don't really have to worry about installing you know java on your machine and then it allows you to access it uh through like a just a regular web browser um so you don't need to you know download any you know java application and then run it and do go jump all through those hoops you can literally just go through a web browser which is very nice and it because it's through it gives a vnc window you can easily plug this into any kind of vnc um controller or, uh anything you have so for me personally i have a ins i have a guacamole instance set up um and i believe i talked about it before on the podcast but basically what it is is it's a web interface that basically allows you to manage like any kind of remote connection so you can manage like ssh terminals you can manage rn or uh, rdp which is uh, remote desktop protocol that's like what windows uses although you can get rdp on linux machines but you just have to install some extra packages it's not that hard i've done it um, and then also vnc which is another um, kind of remote desktop protocol um, so Basically, you, I, I was literally able to just plug this straight into my guacamole instance, so now it's there with all my other remote access machines, and it is very nice, I have to say. Since I've never really had uh, that ability on the uh, with the uh, R510 and the iDRAC6 because, you know, that whole Java issue, uh, because iDRAC7 and beyond, you can just, you know, do that right through the the iDRAC interface, you can just launch it in your web browser and it's no problem. Uh, but the older versions of iDRAC, it, it definitely was a problem. So I was very, very happy to find that uh, Docker container and get that up and running. So now let's actually get into the episode. Uh, so one thing that I, I wanted to address that I've talked about uh, before, which I guess I didn't necessarily explain that much or that well, is this idea of cores and threads when it comes to CPUs. So when we talk about this idea, especially last week's episode when we were comparing uh, the Xserve CPUs to uh, competitors that I, I found you know, on eBay and deals that you could get and kind of comparing them, and I was like, yeah, this one has eight cores and eight threads, and this has 16 cores and 32 threads, and this has 48 core or 24 cores and 48 threads. And uh, I didn't exactly explain what that means. So CPUs have physical cores on them, which are basically uh, it's basically the thing that allows the CPU to perform tasks and perform operations. So at a very, very high level, when you run a program, the operating system is like, okay, they want to run this program. Let me find a physical, let me find a CPU core to run this program on. And then it puts it on that CPU core, and that CPU core runs the program, and bingo, bingo. It's obviously a lot more complicated than that. There's like a whole scheduler involved that deals with you know, when the program gets to be run on what CPU core, and, you know, there's a whole bunch to it. But that's the simple version. The operating system takes your program, finds a CPU core, and puts it on there. That CPU core does whatever your program's supposed to do, and there you go. Um, now, 
there's a technology that I, I believe Intel was the one that kind of pioneered it called hyperthreading. Now, what hyperthreading is, is basically divides a physical CPU core into two logical cores or two threads. So if you have one CPU core, but it has hyperthreading, you essentially have two CPU cores, even though there's only one physical core. So you have two threads. Now the operating, as far as the operating system's concerned, that's two cores that it can throw, you know, tasks and programs on. Um, so when we say something has four cores and eight threads, for example, what we're saying is it has four logical CPU cores built on the chip, and then it also has hyper-threading um, on each one of those cores, so it has a total of eight threads. Um, now, I guess another question can come up, does more threads, does more cores and more threads equal more better? Now, this is kind of a complex question. It's not necessarily cut and dry like yes or no. Uh, and the reason for that is because there's a difference between single-threaded performance and multi-threaded performance. Now, single-threaded performance is just like the performance of just using a single CPU core or single thread on your machine where multi-threaded performance is basically using everything that you have, every single thread, every single core that the machine has available to it is using. So what's kind of the performance difference? Now, in the server realm and the enterprise realm, in a way, yes, more cores and more threads does equal more better, mainly because if you have, say, 24 cores and 48 threads that allows you to do a lot more things like, you know, more virtual machines or you have a lot more comp uh, cores and threads and compute power for, you know, doing large data sets or, you know, compiling large code bases or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so in that case, yes, more cores, more threads, more better. But in the consumer realm, that's not necessarily the case because you're not necessarily trying to, you know, virtualize a bunch of different OSs and, you know, compile like super large complex uh, programs. And, you know, you don't necessarily need a ton of those cores like always, you know, running and, you know, getting as much compute as possible. Uh, you're mainly focused, I, I say you, as, you know, the average consumer is mainly focused on, you know, doing Excel spreadsheets, you know, writing Word documents, browsing the web, and all that kind of stuff. And for the most part, that's just single-threaded applications. So, you know, running on a single thread, single core, that kind of a thing. Um, I mean, sure, there's going to be the the software developers out there, the video editors out there, the, the gamers out there that could take advantage of, you know, multi-threaded uh, performance. But in your regular day-to-day -day tasking, you're mainly just using the single-threaded performance. So a higher single-threaded score um, would be more beneficial to you rather than a gigantic multi-core score. Which I, it, the, the thing that you can really see wh where this um, actually applies, if you look at the, uh, the scores for enterprise CPUs versus like consumer CPUs the enter especially within the same generation uh, but just kind of also in general too uh, the enterprise CPUs generally kick butt when it comes to multi-threaded performance because they just have so many cores and threads on them so it makes sense why they'd be really good in that department but the place they really slack is the single threaded performance like for example I have a uh, 2017 uh, 13 inch MacBook Pro, which in regards to its multi threaded performance is absolutely horrific. It is terrible. But when you compare its single threaded performance, I believe it's like the second best computer I own when it comes to single threaded performance, which is kind of hilarious seeing how woefully underpowered it is when it comes to, you know, anything like super demanding. Um, like, actually, I, I don't recall I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but when we were talking about you know how abysmal the Xserve was in performance uh, last week, this 2017 13 inch MacBook Pro multi-threaded performance is basically on par 
with that excerpt, and I believe it might be even a tiny bit lower, which is kind of hilarious. But when you look at its single-threaded performance, it blows pretty much everything else out of the water, um, which is kind of what you expect with a, a single thread or a, for a single-threaded performance on a con, on a consumer chip. Um, so, and, and this goes across, across the board. Like if you're looking at consumer desktops or consumer laptops, the single threaded performance on those at, makes like, you know, the, the server chips and the enterprise chips look like peasants, like terrible trash garbage. Um, but I mean, if you think about it, that's not what, you know, those chips were designed to do. They each have a design purpose and, you know, they're appealing to the, that design purpose so you know that's that's you know what it is although nowadays um you know kind of we also kind of talked about um you know the how an older enterprise chips can kind of compete with uh newer consumer chips uh, at least in the multi-threaded performance because we all know as we just mentioned single threaded ain't even close um if you could swallow the power bill um but but like even now, like if you compare some of these consumer chips to um, older enterprise chips, they're getting you similar multi-threaded performance with less cores, less threads, and in most cases, a lot less power. Also, um, now granted, they're going to be more expensive, um, but you could argue that the cost savings you would save in all the electricity uh, from you know, it being a newer chip on a newer architecture and more um, power efficient, you could argue that, yeah, you're paying more for it, but, you know, over the long term, it's actually cheaper because of how much power you would save. Um, and you can do the calculus on that uh, if you want. Um, but needless to say, nowadays, now that uh, Intel actually has a, a fire lit under them, um, with Apple, with their Apple Silicon chips and AMD finally coming back to the world of powerful computing. Um, there's actually um, some competition in the marketplace, which is really great to see. Um, and see, being able to see these, you know, l larger gains year over year, rather than if you took uh, an Intel CPU from basically pretty much anything from like the mid 2010s um especially in like the laptop realm your performance is basically going to be the same regardless of what chip you get um especially nowadays um in 2022 if you are gonna buy an, an intel chip from you know somewhere in the mid 2010s like somewhere between i don't know like 2011 2012 to like 2016 2017 ish it really doesn't matter too much. You're probably not going to see a whole lot of performance difference um, because at that point, Intel was pretty much the only player in town and they were like, eh, we don't need to worry about, you know, improving our chips that much because no one's competing. Um, but now that there's actually competition, they're actually forced to compete, which is, it's nice to see that the, the competition is back um, and chips are improving and it's, it's just great to see. Um, now, what's not great to see, um, some of you have maybe already seen this, since I think it's been out for a little bit, but Google has declared war on ad blockers and any other uh, browser extension that runs on Manifest V2. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar, Google is kind of the king when it comes to browsers. Um, I'm sure either you or someone you know uses Google Chrome as their main browser um, or uses one of the many Chrome clones. Um, and by Chrome clone, I mean it's technically named a different browser, but it runs on the same Chromium like source code and Chromium base, which is just Google Chrome essentially. Um, so Google has been working on this new version called Manifest 3, which is basically how browser extensions are have to, you know, integrate with the browser and, and that kind of thing. 
Um, so they're making this, so they've been working on this manifest three for about four years now, and they're finally going to make it mandatory in two, in January of 2023. Um, but there is going to be an enterprise exception, um, till January of 2024. And when this transition happens, manifest V2 is going to be gone. Now, the reason why this is... I guess you could say bad is because the reason why ad blockers work so well is because they use manifest v2 and the changes that are coming in manifest v3 essentially cripple all the ad blockers. Um, so Google claims, so, you know, this is Google we're talking about. So, you know, take this with however much salt you want or as as you know, gospel truth as you want, depending on which side of the the aisle you lie on when it comes to Google. But they claim that uh, there is more. The more limited pat platform is meant to bring enhancements in security, privacy, and performance. Now, if you ask me, Google saying they care about privacy. It's kind of like a spouse that cheats on their significant other, saying they care about loyalty. Um, it's kind of a joke, uh, but, you know, it is what it is, I guess. Um, now, now, actually, hold on. I, I, you know what? I take it, I take it all back. Google 100% cares about your privacy. Now, why do I say that, even though I made that joke that they, they don't and it's a complete joke but that they care about your privacy? The reason why they actually do care, here we go into the conspiracy theory area with my, you know, that I make up for fun. The reason they do care is because if they didn't keep your data safe, then advertisers wouldn't need them, right? So if Google didn't harvest all your data for themselves then and keep it lock and key, then everyone else could harvest your data and they wouldn't need to go through Google, meaning Google wouldn't make the moolah. So maybe Google actually does care about your privacy in regards to keeping all of your data that they harvest on you safe from anyone else. So anyone else that wants your data has to go through Google in order to get it. These are the big brain moves right here that Google's making. Um, now anyway, that that tangent and joke aside, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a, a, a privacy uh Foc more more privacy focused place uh, they said that google if google really cared about the security of its, its extension sh extension store it should uh just police the store more actively um and use actual humans to do it rather than you know whatever automated process they have um which uh if you go on to the google extension store for chrome uh there definitely are a fair share of obvious scams and terrible extensions that are definitely not legit on there. Um, so I, I think they could probably do a better job of policing that for sure. Um, now, I mentioned how ad blockers uh, use this manifest V2 in order to work. So in a nutshell, how this works is the manifest v2 protocol thing whatever api whatever it is basically what they can do is when a network request is either coming in or out what the ad blocker will do will intercept that request and then they can strip out all the requests for ads or anything ad related they can just strip that out so when it comes to you you don't have to deal with any of the ads now Google is going to be re essentially removing this part in Manifest V3 as a supposed security measure, quote unquote, um, to prevent bad actors. Um, yeah. So the biggest, but one of the biggest concerns with the removal of Manifest V2 is how big Google's market share is. Um, like if you look at the market share of Chrome, it's absolutely enormous. And then when you factor in how many 
Google Chrome clones there are and you add up that market share in addition to Chrome's, it, it's insane. Pretty much the only people that are even relevant that don't use Chrome are Safari, which the main reason Safari is so high is because it's like the default browser on your phone, on iPhones. And there's a lot of iPhones out there and people don't feel like changing their browser. Um, and then Firefox. Um, so if you're using Firefox or Safari, I believe you should be safe. I'm not 100% sure on Safari, but I know Firefox, uh, Mozilla has come out and said that the aspects of V of Manifest V3 that prevent the ad blocking capabilities, they're just going to straight up not support. So ad blockers will still be uh, able to be used. So hopefully uh, you're not a... Um, it, you're hopefully you're not so rooted in in Google land that you are super tied to their browser and I mean if you're like me I never use Google Chrome anyway so this is is it pers for personally for me this really is kind of a non-issue uh, which is why I kind of haven't covered it um, but I realized uh, with how big Google's market share is there's probably at least there's probably a good chunk of you out there that are listening that either use it use you know google chrome or one of its subsidiaries uh one of its clones or you know of someone um that uses google chrome or one of its clones um which in that case you obviously should totally share this podcast with them so they can hear about you know what's coming uh with google chrome because there's also a chance that they might be using some kind of ad blocker or some other extension with Chrome that potentially could be kneecapped um, with this transition from Manifest V2 uh, to Manifest V3. Um, so the EEF or the EFF, the um, Electronic Frontier Foundation, has also stated uh, that Goo this whole privacy thing is deceitful and threatening. Um, and they said that Manifest V3 will restrict the capabilities of web extensions, especially those that are designed to monitor, modify, and compute alongside the, convent, uh, the conversation to your web browser, uh, that the websites you visit. Um, basically, um, you know, being able, essentially this is, you know, to remove the trackers, remove any malicious things that are trying to attack your website or attack you from websites because, you know, like we mentioned, the way that these ad blockers work is intercepting the network requests and being able to strip things out. So if you're not able to strip those things out, you're able to allow trackers to come through. You're able to allow, you know, any kind of like anything trying to, you know, harvest your data, allow that to come through. So there's a lot of things that uh, this removal of being able to intercept network requests takes it allows rather than just um you know allowing you to strip ads out uh from a website or strip ads from a youtube video or something like that um they also go on to mention that malicious malicious extensions are mostly interested in stealing data and that manifest v3 only stops extensions from blocking data not inspecting it so google isn't doing much to stop bad actors which, I mean, if we think about it, you know, Google only cares about, you know, their revenue streams. And if they can, you know, essentially remove all ad blockers, you know, from working, that means more ad revenue coming towards Google's way, which means they make more money. You see more ads, you know, they can harvest more data through the trackers. And it's just, you know, essentially a big win for Google. Um, so, you know. I mean, for, for, for what it is, I will have um, an Ars Technica article and Google's actual, um, uh, I guess I guess it was a blog post or what, basically their announcement of this that you can go look at, um, as well as uh, Firefox is mentioning that they're not going to support um, the stuff that get, allows uh, ad blockers to essentially go the way of the dinosaurs. Um, now, I guess one thing I will also mention is, obviously... The big ad blockers like uBlock Origin and, you know, any of the other ad blockers out there, um, just because uh, this Manifest V3 is coming, that doesn't mean they're just going to, you know, throw up their hands and say, well, we tried. Uh, there's nothing we can do about it. They're obviously going to, you know, keep trying um, to make their ad blockers work, um, but I, I think the effectiveness will definitely... Um, 
take a hit. Uh, unless you're using, you know, Firefox or something like that where this really isn't an issue. Um, and the last thing I want to touch on is this idea of writing complex code. Now, recently, I, I, I th I've mentioned this before that I am unfortunately enrolled in a graduate school program. Um, now, one of the things that I was forced to do was write some of the most disgusting, horrendous, and unreadable code that I have ever written in my entire life. Now, before you kind of come at me and say, well, that's the point of the class was, you know, to allow you to, you know, understand, you know, new methods of coding and use, you know, libraries and all this stuff. I get that. I get that. But the, the thing is, when it comes to coding, especially in a professional environment or just for your own personal use that you want to, you know, put on your GitHub or, you know, open source or, you know, any any code that is going to have eyes on it that aren't your own and honestly even code that will have your eyes on it down the line you don't want to make complex because no one's going to be able to understand it heck when i was doing these assignments i couldn't even understand it and i was literally in the process of writing it in the moment like i would i kid you not how many times I would be like halfway through writing the line and being like, all right, what the heck is this actually saying? And then I would write like a couple more parts of it and be like, okay, what's that saying? Because of how complex it is. So another, and, and one of the biggest, um, I guess, culprits of this are Lambda functions, which if you've never heard of Lambda functions, um, I, I honestly am, am happy for you because they are so disgusting looking it's essentially writing an entire function that you would have like you know spread out on multiple lines with you know variables and for loops and you know a lot of things that make it easier to read essentially take that function that you can easily read condense it and cram it into a single line more or less i mean i guess you can have lambdas that take up multiple lines but the idea of a lambda is essentially to be like an inline function and it's not pretty. It's not pretty to look at, it's not pretty to write, and it's not pretty to read. Now, the other argument that I have against, you know, these complex, you know, one-liner type code things is with how good compilers are these days, unless you specifically turn off optimization on your compiler, you're fancy complex one-liner isn't going to mean anything it's all going to be reduced to negligible no difference when it comes to compile time and your your code's actually compiled into an executable um, and the reason for this is if you think about you know say you're writing some fancy complex you know return statement so you don't need to write any if statements now sure you condensed say potentially you know, five, six lines of code down to one line of code. But as far as the compiler is concerned, when you optimize that, you know, it's not going to make a darn a darn difference at all because, you know, the compiler can, you know, account for that and mitigate it. So really all you did was made your life a lot harder when you come back to it in a few months or a year and you're trying to figure out what the heck you're doing. Uh, you make anyone looking at your code having have a hard time because they don't know what the heck you're doing. Um, and it's just not a good, good, good experience. Now, some people will be like, oh, you should write complex code because it's guaranteed job security. And that's just, a, in my opinion, that's just a really scummy thing to do because imagine you were like writing a book and you said like, I'm not necessarily finished with this book yet, but I'm going to make it basically impossible to comprehend so no one can take over my job in finishing the book i mean that's just a stupid argument right like no one would no author in their right mind would do that kind of a thing um so don't write complex code and honestly the only times that i've really been forced to write complex code was for school assignments, which is kind of hilarious because school assignments are supposed to, you know, prepare you for the real world, theoretically. 
Obviously, that's not the case here. But I, I understand. What I will say is, I understand the point they're trying to make. The point they're trying to make is to get you to either understand a concept, or understand a library, or understand a function, or understand something rather than, you know, doing it a generic way. So in that sense, I understand where they're coming from. But in my opinion, it just gives a really bad impression on how you should code. And one another good example of this was back in my undergrad um, experience, I was forced to write the Fibonacci sequence, which normally you do with recursion, using shared memory and pipes. So... Obviously, the point of this was to, you know, learn and under better understand how low-level parts of the operating system work, where rather than, you know, essentially looping back on itself with recursion to solve the problem, you're using either a shared memory location where you're updating a shared memory location or passing things through pipes. Now, I'm not going to get into all that low-level operating system stuff. But if you're if you're interested in looking at that Fibonacci sequence using shared memory and recursion, or not not recursion, uh, shared memory and pipes, uh, if you go to my GitHub, uh, Dark Assassin Twenty Three on GitHub, I have a repository on there called I think I believe I called it like overly complex Fibonacci or something like that. You can go ahead and look at it. It's it's absolutely disgusting. Um, it looks gross. It's terrible. Um, I don't like looking at it. <laughs> the honestly, the only reason I put it up there on my GitHub was because I had such a hard time figuring it out, and it was such a pain. I was like, you know, I'm gonna be that guy that posts the solutions to the internet so anyone can find it. So if someone else is having as much pain and trouble as I am with this assignment, they can at least have some encouragement of you know kind of what it should look like. Um, now, obviously, I'm not encouraging cheating out there, so if any of you are in some undergrad program or grad program or are, for whatever reason, forced to write the Fibonacci sequence using pipes and or shared memory, obviously do not copy my code, but I am just saying I made it available so anyone that cares to see the atrocity and disgustingness of why you shouldn't write code that way, uh, by, by all means, go and look at it. Um, and you will find out quite quickly how little sense it makes and how much deciphering and digging into the code you have to do in order to understand what it's actually trying to do, which is kind of kind of the big thing with complex code and why you shouldn't write complex code because it takes so long to try to understand what the heck is going on that like you'll be sitting there scratching your head trying to figure out what this person was saying rather than being able to understand what they're saying what the code's doing and being able to build off that or use that function or you know whatever the case may be because obviously uh kind of Obviously, it doesn't necessarily get followed, but one of the rule, basic rules when it comes to writing code and whatnot is you shouldn't use code that you don't understand. Um, now, has is that to say that every software developer um, has never found something on Stack Overflow, copied it, pasted it into their code, hit run, it worked, and they just said, woohoo, I'm done now? No, because obviously uh, I, I would almost be willing to bet money that anyone that's done any kind of coding or software development has done that at least once. But, the, but what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to be able to understand the code that you're either using, referencing, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to, you know, fully... Um, understand everything about the code and why it works, but you should at least understand, okay, I cannot kind of see, you know, the, the logic here. I can kind of, you can at least kind of, you know, 
I guess, get the Spark Notes version, if you will, of, you know, kind of what's going on. You don't have to know every single intricacy and detail, maybe, per se, especially if it's some code, like, you know, function that you're going to be referencing or using. Uh, but you should at least be able to understand what it's doing rather than just seeing this, you know, gobbledygook blob of gibberish and being like, all right, I'm just going to use that. Because that's where you run into issues where um, there's there could be exploits in there, there could be other vulnerabilities, there could be you know trackers, there could you know who knows what could actually be in that code if you don't actually you know understand you know what's going on. Which is another reason why the open source community is so great because literally if you're running an open source program you could literally go to you know say the github page for it and dissect every single line of code in there to see exactly what's going on to make sure there's no funny business going on in there which you couldn't do uh with a proprietary or a closed source um program where you don't have access to that source code so you can't see what's going on um so i'm just gonna so picking a random uh program here like say uh the Adobe Suite, for example, that's a proprietary closed source um, operating or not operating system program. Um, so, I mean, you can't necessarily say for certain that, you know, there's not any kind of funky, spooky business going on behind the scenes that Adobe threw in there. Um, whereas if you use like an open source version, like say GIMP, for example, which is kind of Photoshop, but free and open source essentially gimp you could actually go in you know and inspect everything every line to make sure that no funky business going on uh but if you wrote that program using only complex code no one could really understand what's going on and they'd be like well i don't understand what's going on so because i don't know what's going on i don't want to use it um so that could be it that could be another thing but the main thing why you shouldn't write complex code is readability shareability and just honestly for yourself more if if any if anything don't write complex code for yourself because when you inevitably come back to this program or come back to this project if you wrote some complex piece of code because you think you were being clever you're probably not going to understand what it means in a couple months' time. Because I, I know from personal experience, I have... And I wasn't even writing complex code. I was just writing regular code. And I'll come back to it in a few months, and I'll have to actually like look through and read it and be like, all right, what was I doing here? Now, just imagine if I actually wrote complex code that was like, you know not just easy to parse and read i'd be sitting there for i'd probably just give up and be like meh who cares <laughs> um so yeah do it at, at the bare minimum just do it for yourself it'll make your life easier um and another reason why you probably should is if you you know like i mentioned if you put it on like your github or something and an employer uh is you know wanting to hire you and they go to your github uh they might, you know, come across that that project where you wrote all that complex code and be like, what does all this code mean? You're going to be like, oh, and then that tells them, hmm, how did you write this code then? Did you just, you know, copy it from somewhere? And they might start to question your ability. So it's definitely best, um, even though it might be cool to write, you know, all this code that could have been done in, you know, 15, 20 lines of easily readable code into, say, like, three or four lines of super complex code. While that can be cool because you cut down um, a lot as far as, you know, space in the source file is concerned, it's probably not going to really do anything as far as the, the broader scale uh, as far as like actual execution time because of you know compilers exist uh, plus when you inevitably inevitably come back to that code you're probably not going to understand what it means um, and on the on the subject of you know complex code just because you write something and make it you know more complex and condense a bunch of lines down to one that doesn't mean it's going to be faster um, and the reason I say this is this is obviously a hundred percent anecdotal. Um, so there's obviously going to be cases where this isn't the case. Uh, but the one of the 
uh, programs I was working on recently was in Python um, for school, which is gross. Uh, but I was working on a Python project where I had to use NumPy and Pandas and essentially use one-liners in, with Pandas to get data output. And we were forced not to use any kind of if statements or for loops. And the irony is, I, I, obviously I didn't read the directions because that, that's how I found this out. Um, I did it the normal way, which is using if statements and for loops. And um, I kept that code in there just to make sure I was my one-liner was you know actually correct because like I mentioned, I was confusing myself while I was trying to write this complex code one-liner. Um, and the funny thing was, I like I wasn't even timing it at all, but there was a noticeable difference between doing it the what I would consider the right way, which is a for which is for loops and if statements, versus the complex way, which might be considered as the quote unquote faster or better way because it's less lines of code. Um, and I bet you can't guess which one was faster. And it was actually the for loop with the if statement was noticeably faster uh, than the one liner. So in that case, if you wrote that complex piece of code, you essentially wrote it for nothing because not only is it harder to read, but it's also slower. <laughs> so there's really no winning here, um, aside from the fact that if you want your source code file to be a few bytes smaller, which especially nowadays with you know file sizes essentially being negligible, um, there's literally zero point to doing that. Um, and even still, I would argue the extra bytes for making the file, the source file a little bit bigger is definitely worth the speed trade off. Because if you're going to have a considerable speed up in code, but say have an extra, I don't know, 500 bytes max, I mean, I would take that extra 500 bytes for noticeable speed increases, especially once you actually scale up to bigger and larger data sets. Um, because if something, say you're on a, I don't know, like a thousand item data set and you have a, you know, a slightly noticeable difference, if you scale that thousand up to like a hundred thousand or a million or even bigger, that, that difference is only going to grow and get worse. Um, as far as, you know, the, the difference in the gap between the two. Um, so yeah, don't write, please don't write complex code unless you're forced to, uh, just don't do it for your own sanity and for the sanity of anyone that ever has to look at that piece of code. And you know, with that, I think that's a good place, uh, to end it there. So if you enjoyed this episode that I ask that you leave a rating and review and subscribe to the dark assassins podcast, if you haven't done so already, uh, also be sure to share with a friend or family member, especially if you know anyone that's using Google Chrome so they can understand what's coming down the pipeline for them and maybe get them to jump ship uh, to say something like Firefox before it's too late. Um, and if you have any questions about this episode or you have any questions for topics you want me to cover in future episodes, uh, feel free to send me an email at contact at darkassassinsinc.com, or you can click the link in the show notes below. And that's going to do it for me in this episode of the Dark Assassins podcast. Until next time, my fellow assassins, remember, bull nothing equals true. If action not equal to null, return true. I'll see you next time on the Dark Assassin's Podcast.